Assalamu alaikum and good evening everybody. Today we are going to have our a, 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 a case studies and today's case presenter will be Assistant Professor Dr. Kanij Fatema. She is a professor of critical care medicine working in the Bardem, which is the premier institution for diabetes and other endocrine diseases. And she has extensive experience regarding uh, the management of ICU patients. We are interested in her perspective in dealing with different situations where the cardiac issue is an important factor in determining the outcome of the ICU patients. And amongst our panelists, we have our, our guru, uh, Dr. Rafiq Ahmed Sar, and also Chaudhary Hafizul Hassan will be joining shortly. And also amongst the uh, foreign specialist, Dr. Professor Orun Maski and Professor Shujib Bhandari has joined us. And in our from our national faculties, we have many more eminent cardiologists that all of us know, including Professor Atara Ali, my co-partner and course director, Professor Mohsin Hussain, uh, Professor Shardan Makaddas Hussain, Professor Abdullah Al Jamil, Khandukar Asadud Jaman, and many more. I hope, as before, we all will be enjoying and enlightening ourselves from the case scenarios that will be bring forth by Dr. Kanich Fatima. Kanich, I hope, uh, like the last time, we'll be enjoying again and again. And Rafiq Sar is there to guide us again and again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, sir. Uh, should I start now? Yeah, me, you can share. You can start sharing. Uh, respected senior, my fellow and junior colleagues, Assalamu alaikum. I'm Dr. Kanis Fatima. Uh, in the beginning, I'd like to again express my gratitude to Professor Abdul Wadu Choudhury, sir, and Professor Adhari, sir, for inviting me in this uh, panel. Uh, previously, I have discussed two cases. Now, uh, today, I'll start from my case three. A 42-year-old male who was diagnosed case of hypertension, dyslipidemia, presented in, the, in our intensive care unit with gradual loss of consciousness over two days. He was a businessman by profession and uh, was a regular alcohol intaker. On query, his family gave history that uh, three days previous uh, to ISO admission, he had a party with his friend and there he had heavy alcohol intake. One and a half day later, he had complained of uh, dimness of vision and fell on ground. But uh, family did not uh, give importance to that. Then one day later, he, was, uh, he became totally unconscious and was brought to our ICU. On admission, his ECG showed severe metabolic acidosis with respiratory acidosis. He had hyperkalemia, raised urea creatinine raised CPK and ultrasound showed grade two fatty liver. This was his ECG, which was done on admission. We can see that there is sinus tachycardia with incomplete right bundle branch block. Bedside echocardiography was done by our cardiologist on next day, which showed anterior ischemia and uh, suspicion, there was suspicion of myocardial infarction. There was mild LV systolic dysfunction, left ventricularization fraction was 47%. His troponin I, which was done on admission was 0.19 nanogram per ml. The cutoff value was 0 0.06. After getting the echo report, which was done on the second day, we again repeat the troponin I. This time it was 1.37. And uh, next day we did the third sample, which was 0.36 nanogram per ml. 
as the patient had severe metabolic acidosis associated with visual abnormalities and CNS involvement, we treated him as a case of methanol poisoning. And in case of methanol poisoning, there is uh, as associated myocardial uh, dysfunction due to methanol and severe metabolic acidosis can also cause myocardial depression. There are several studies which showed that uh, there are uh, some ECG abnormalities like J-point elevation, QT prolongation, T-wave abnormalities or ST abnormalities in case of patient with methanol poisoning. Around 5.3% of methanol toxicity patient may present with acute myocardial infarction. In our patient, uh, we assume that this raised troponin I level may be due to methanol induced myocarditis. Now, uh, the next case, my next two cases are almost similar. The first one, a female patient, 67 year old, diabetic, hypertensive, asthmatic lady. We can she discuss a little bit about case three. Okay, sir. Uh, Rafik sir, can I ask you a question? When there is troponin I raised, but the patient do not have the typical uh, background of ischemic chest pain history, should we be calling it non-STMI or should we be calling it cardiac injury? Well, two issues. Uh, first of all, the ECG itself, uh, there, there is not much. Of it. Even though it has been defined as incomplete, I don't think the cure is duration is more than 100 milliseconds. So there is no acute change in the EKG to suggest myocardial ischemia. So next slide, please. The, the other question I have for you all is, can you show me the next slide? The uh, echo so diagnosis of anterior ischemia and myocardial ischemia, the echocardiographic diagnosis of anterior ischemia and myocardial infarction. Um, I don't do echo regularly, but what do, can you make that comment from a single echocardiogram? Uh, one thing, one thing uh, I would say, uh, sir, uh, from the echo, we should call what is the ejection fraction, whether, whether there is any regional valvation abnormality. But calling itself that only ischemia is very difficult because cardiac injury due to either septicemia or a toxin, they can also produce uh, a ischemic regional mm -hmm. valvation abnormalities. So in this case, when the ECG is not at all suggestive, uh, I would rather go for descriptive description. The, this digestion fraction is like this, while motion abnormality is like this. <coughs> yes. So I, I think this is one point that when we were medical students, I mean, EKGs were rare, but when there was some ECG, some would say definitive ischemia from one single ECG, same with echo, I think we should describe the finding. And if they correlate with the clinical picture, then at best we can make a comment, consider ischemia. But just by single EKG to call anti ischemia is, is difficult. We don't do that here. Um, same with diagnosis of myocardial infarction. We can say suggest. So that's uh, thank you. Now the troponin, of course, is elevated. I mean, there is different level of troponin that we call uh, elevated troponin. Uh, uh, consider, um, but the non elevation definition has changed recently. Was it right? Yes, sir. The cutoff, that's the part. Um, and of course, there are other causes of troponin elevation. But it's an interesting sir. case, a businessman, why is he drinking methyl alcohol when he's a rich man? He must have bought very cheap alcohol. It's, very, it's alarming for sir. us, for, for me, because, uh, you know, it's interesting. I left Bangladesh and there is a taboo against alcohol. Oh, and oh. it has become fashionable. I have gone to Dhaka club oh. and uh, senior physicians, they were drinking alcohol and they were surprised that I live in America, I don't drink alcohol. Um, there should be some social shaming on this issue. First of all, Islam prohibits alcohol. It's not because you, you have to go to heaven or hell. It is because it is bad for us. And if you look at the new studies in Lancet, alcohol in any level is terrible. And I think we should, we should campaign against this thing. I mean, it is becoming more and more fashionable in Bangladesh and they are 
I go to people's house, they're very surprised that I live in America, I don't drink alcohol. And that's terrible. Sir, I think sir, I want to, uh, I like to say add, something add, about the patient. Sir, uh, uh, can yeah, I say something about the patient? The, before that, Karaj, I, I like to yes, say sir. about the methanol. Uh, the methanol, when the ethanol is mixed with methyl alcohol, the color is almost similar to Johnny Walker, sir. So what, <laughs> what the um, uh, criminals do, they bottle these things and they have a um, uh, cap uh, machine and they re re recap it and mm. re relabel it with the Johnny Walker and sell oh. it in the um, uh, higher uh, hotel and uh, other um, uh, wine shop. So sir. from there, they buy with high price, not cheap, sir. So these, these are the uh, criminal things going on. <laughs> okay. Can, can, I, can I ask you a quick question? Yes, sir. When, uh, when your junior doctors saw this patient, did they consider methyl alcohol poisoning? Yes, sir. I mean, this is very interesting. When I, I, I left medicine behind a long time ago, but this visual, visual issue, right? Yes, sir. That was the clue, and, right? Uh, sir, I want to say something more about the patient history. He was a non-Muslim living in old Dhaka, and uh, he had uh, he has business with uh, gold jewelries. He has a tattoo all over his arm, forearm. So I think uh, his uh, regular uh, drink. Yeah, drink. Well, well, if you look in Bengal, you see, Bengal, it doesn't matter whether it's a Muslim or Hindu. Alcohol was not a very common thing in Bengal. Uh, I mean, I grew up in Bengal, which it didn't matter whether you came from a Muslim family, Hindu or Christian family, whether there was religious, socially, it was a bad thing in, ben in Bengal. But I think that has changed. That's unfortunate. But that's a, a problem all over the world now. Sir, so, can, you back, sir can, can you back to Wadud's question again, sir? Wadud's question? Yes. Sir, no, actually, we... sir? Yeah, go ahead. Sir, actually, what the question was, uh, what should be the actually, uh, what our working diagnosis that is the injury versus non-STMI is yes, because as the patient is unconscious, we cannot give uh, obtain the history that is the uh, history suggestive of the ischemia, but there is uh, rising and fall of the troponin. So yes. we, diagnosis, that is a, we have added, we have added a new diagnosis, elevated troponin. Before we did not have that diagnosis, we used to call any elevation of troponin as non ST elevation marker infarction. But right, in our right, diagnosis right. code, we have a new diagnosis that we do not commit. If we do not think that it has less to cut off level, we do not call that um, uh, non ST elevation marker infarction because once you put the diagnosis, it stays with you for a long time. Right, sir. Thank you. Kali, next case, please. Yes, sir. Uh, Mrs. X, she was a 67-year-old diabetic, hypertensive, and asthmatic lady. She had complained of respiratory distress for one day without any chest pain. As uh, she was uh, having asthma, so her family member uh, thought that this respiratory distress is due to acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma, and they tried to manage her at home due to COVID situation. They were afraid to bring her at hospital. But... Uh, after one day, she suddenly lost her consciousness and was brought to emergency. And through emergency, she was directly admitted to our ICU. On admission, her pass rate was 80 per minute. Blood pressure was 180 over 100 millimeter of mercury. GCS was 8. Uh, she was immediately intubated and put on mechanical ventilator. This was her ECG done on admission. Uh, sorry for the technical uh, fault in lead one. Lead one. Yeah. Uh, so sorry for this technical fault. Uh, we can see here that uh, in, as lead one cannot be uh, seen here, in AVL there is Q wave and ST elevation in V2, V3, V4 with asymmetrical T wave inversion. Her troponin I was very high, that is 4.7 nanogram per ml. Bedside echocardiography done by our cardiologist uh, reported that it was anterior ischemia with concentrating left ventricular hypertrophy. Ejection fraction was 52%.
as patient was unconscious so we did uh, brain imaging which showed massive left sided intracerebral hemorrhage with ventricular extension sir i had a uh, almost similar uh, case next so should i uh, move on or discuss on bccg now we should discuss this case i think atar bhai what will hmm? be your potential diagnosis for bccg uh by ecg it is the anterior mi anterior myocardial infarction definitely is it valence syndrome is ecg diagnosis it could be valence syndrome valence syndrome yes but, this is suggestive of the valence syndrome but could it be still vision it with intracranial hemorrhage this is the reason i think the kanish has presented this case as because this patient has got the intracranial hemorrhage with this such type of ecg Sir, very interesting uh, problem, sir. Can it? What was the troponin? Sir, uh, four point seven nanogram per mL. Cut off uh, value was point zero six. And there was wall motion abnormality. Yes. So we have to call it MI as well. But the point is that, that day, uh, Rafik sir was reminding us that we should always remember in case of intracranial hemorrhage that the patient may have stress cardiomyopathy. and in that case we will be having some ecg changes and there will be raised troponin but if we look at the uh, echo very well we may find we may find that there is ballooning apical ballooning or regional uh, ballooning but before that i have got one question to kanish kanish yes sir actually, yes sir actually, actually the, you saw the ecg fast before scanning yes sir after this ecg whether the patient received any that is the loading dose of the antiplatelet uh, or no like sir no sir sir in our icu we always follow that protocol that if the patient has altered level of consciousness we never uh, give any type of antiplatelet or anticoagulant without doing brain imaging so it is a protocol it is a protocol in our icu actually that is the protocol in almost all the icu and that that should be followed as well in ccu Yes, sir i have a question here yeah uh, so patient that, had before that i like to make a uh, comment here if you look at the uh, avl there is a poav is inverted how can you correlate is there is a lead limb lead inversion reversal uh, asad can sir? i say thing sir? my thumb is that if one of the limb leads to straight straight line No, yes, sir. Yes, sir. You should not consider that ECG limb part. No, 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 sir. I am just as, as there is one is missing here. Some uh, maybe, may but but Le AVR is AVR is uh, negative. Yes, that is yes, uh, that is uh, so. Uh, I think the uh, this is consistent with the normal findings. But as the uh, P in AVR is negative, what should be actually? No, whenever you get a straight line, there is a very likelihood there is a. Upper limb, lower limb, lead displacement, transposition. That's a problem, and we should have a second ECG properly placed, and then consider whether we should be declaring anything. I would not consider anything on the limb lead part. I would only consider the chest lead part. Rafik sir. Yes, I I think I agree with you because what I want to reemphasize what what do they saying is that once we have lost a one of the limbs the avr avl they become um, it'll be changed because the configuration has changed so we should just look at the other lead the two three mm -hmm. avf is upright so we can say well most likely this is sinus rhythm but if we want to determine the whether it is sinus or not then we have to have the other limb lead placed and then repeat the ecg go ahead sir, sir, uh, sir should i ask uh, my question yes, yes. the patient had complaints of respiratory distress for one day uh though she didn't complain of any type of chest pain and later she had lost her consciousness so uh what should be uh, we think that the what was the primary effect uh, mi followed by intracerebral hemorrhage uh, hello sir uh, the the timing the question is 
the shortness of breath, and I don't know if there are any changes coming because patient is unconscious, patient cannot tell anything. If the yes. shortness of breath was there for a day, we have to assume that the cardiac event came first. And who knows, maybe the discomfort itself increased the blood pressure more than what we are looking at now and resulted in the CBA. So sequentially, I think probably the coronary event came first, followed by yes. the CBA. Sir, alternative, alternative explanation can it be, sir? That, that is the stroke was the first followed by the stress cardiomyopathy. Oh, the question is that, is it possible that stroke came first followed by cardiomyopathy? Uh, yes, but stress cardiomyopathy should not change, show this ischemic change, unlikely, and the troponin elevation. Uh, those are kind of, because this is a remarkable ST elevation. Um, if you look at stroke itself, you get much deeper almost symmetrical T inversion without the ST elevation, but this is clearly ST elevation um, with an evolving MI and consistent with the clinical finding. But sir, uh, in this COVID era, in who have Takoshuba cardiomyopathy, looking with COVID infection, they have typical ST elevation like a simulating MI. Only after uh, looking at the echo and doing the angiogram, we find that they actually, the patient do not have coronary atherosclerotic disease. And later, uh, re-evaluation find out that this is actually a case of Takashubo. That can happen, sir, actually. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, but, but the question is, did they have blood clot which dissolved? Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's a possibility, definitely, no question about it. But we have to entertain all those things. In the differential diagnosis that uh, CVA followed by this um, Takashubo. Uh, but why will the patient then have suddenly shortness of breath from a stroke, right? And uh, I'm sure the family member mentioned, right, Kanis, that patient yes, was sir. very short of breath. And I think suddenly there was a sudden change. Why will a stroke yes. patient get shortness of breath? So should I but proceed to? Yes, how, what did he do about this patient? Because this Sir, uh, patient ultimately developed uh, brain death. Neurosurgeons opted for uh, conservative management and patient uh, had brain death and we declared her later. Actually, this case actually emphasizes that sometimes both intracranial hemorrhage and cardiac problem come together. And whenever this happens, we have to consider the brain hemorrhage thing first and foremost. We cannot give any... Uh, uh, antiplatelet, anticoagulant, thrombolysis, nothing. And we can, we, we, we also should not be using nitrate as well very much because nitrate can increase the intracranial pressure and that can lead to more problem. And the patient may have uh, prolapse of the brain because of raised cranial pressure and may die as well. And this patient had actually shifted uh, a midline shift, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, uh, as you have mentioned that we cannot use nitrate, but if uh, not in this case, but in other cases when there are uh, severe hypertension, like blood pressure is more than 220 or uh, diastolic is more than 120, we have to use intravenous antihypertensive. And we have uh, two options in our ISO, that is either nitrate or labetalol. But in case of uh, patient with uh, brain pathology, we usually prefer nitrate because in case of if we give labetalol, the, uh, there may be bradycardia and uh, we can, in that, if the patient develops raised ICP, that will be difficult for us to uh, think what is the cause of the bradycardia, whether it is due to labetalol or raised ICP. So hey. which should be the first choice, labetalol or nitrate in Actually, case of cardiac we, plus CNS event? Actually, the best choice is the calcium tenor blocker, nicardipine. And there are some new medicine that has come up. Those are also calcium channel blocker. And labetalol actually uh, produces... Is it available in IV root, sir, in our country? I would prefer both labetalol and a little bit of nitrate combination. Labetalol actually do not produce that much of bradycardia, except in very high dose. I'm telling that from my uh, wide use of this experience uh, after using this. But... Nitrate use can lead to that problem. Nicardibine would have been a very good choice. I do wish 
some of our company uh, pharmaceutical company should bring this uh, wonderful medicine because nicotinamide do not increases intracranial pressure do not increase coronary ischemia it's a very balanced uh, dilator and it reduces pressure without increasing the heart rate so it's a wonderful drug in case of acute cardiac um, acute hypertensive emergency situations atar bhai can i add something please uh, sure sure karaj bhai welcome actually nitrate usually predominantly dilates the extracranial blood vessels not the intracranial blood vessels and there is a possibility of shunting of blood towards the extracranial arteries and there might be secondary cerebral ischemia so uh, it is uh, uh, the use of nitrate uh, is uh, not necessarily lead to the raised intracranial pressure but there may be shunting of blood and cerebral ischemia after intracranial hemorrhage is a, one of the most important cause of morbidity and mortality after intracranial bleed and their uh, director professor wadud has rightly pointed out that nicardipine is the drug which can produce uh, the the reduce the vasospasm and reduce the subsequent cerebral ischemia so uh, with use of nitrate there is a chance of uh, aggravated cerebral ischemia as well and we should also keep in mind that that uh, that nitrate is not an anti hypertensive drug by any classification the, the nitrate though we use it but it is it is not included in any classification of anti hypertensive medication can uh, is one question is why uh, craniectomy to reduce the uh, pressure and vp shunting was done in this case so it was not done why why was not it done oh uh because sir uh, when the neurosurgeon visited the patient i have shown that uh, on admission her gcs was around 8 but when the neurosurgeon visited the patient her gcs uh, fell down to 5 or 6 i think and uh, as the prognosis was not good so uh, neurosurgeon opted for conservative management actually when about the gcs falls uh, below 8 7 or below in that case even with surgical intervention the outcome is in our country at least very very bad so uh, doing an intervention uh, uh, um, creating a huge uh, bill and taking the dead body out of the icu all these three things create a lot of problem for the doctor and the family as well so when the gcs is low the surgeons very uh, much unwilling to do it second is she had an mi as well that creates any patient with mi acute mi uh, st elevated and troponin is raised region or valve muscle deformity present in that case any surgical option can lead to uh, massive uh, cardiac problem issue as well and the outcome is very likely low so i would i would actually opted for the same thing as the uh, neurosurgeon has done So, Kanish Fatima, actually, yes, uh, what is the conclusion finally? That is, uh, for the severe uh, blood, uh, sir, I have a brief discussion uh, after the next case, similar type of case. No, after no, no, that, no. I have a brief uh, discussion. That is the management of the hypertension in such cases. That is the nitrate versus levetiracetam versus nicardipine. Actually, what will be the final? The f- uh, first of all, in case of intracerebral hemorrhage, uh, we should not lower the blood pressure very aggressively. we have to keep the mean arterial pressure more than uh, 90 or 100 uh, it should be our target and if we have to lower the blood pressure then as uh, sirs have said that uh, the nicardipine should be the first choice as it is not uh, available till now so we can uh, go for labetalol that's the thing sir thank you next case Can I? Uh, do you have sodium nitrate peroxide in Bangladesh? Do you use? Can I ask you? We, uh, sir, uh, we do not have it in our ICU. I don't know about sir. Yeah, the, the thing, the thing about drugs in this situation is, you want to use a drug that has very short half life, and that washes up quickly. Sodium nitrate peroxide has half life of two minutes. so the good thing about sodium nitrate peroxide is it's only intravenous there is no oral preparation and in this kind of situation you can titrate very well 
NICA deep in half life is 48 minutes. So if the blood pressure drops, then you have to wait for a long time. So that's one drug. I mean, it's a old drug. Even in this country, we use it less and less, but it is a wonderful drug to use um, in this kind of situation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now the next patient he was a male patient, 55 year old, diagnosed case of bronchial asthma, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, and end stage urinary disease. He was getting regular maintenance hemodialysis thrice weekly. He had complained of altered level of consciousness for the last 12 hours. As per his wife, uh, he had regular hemodialysis on the day before his admission in ICU. After going back home, uh, he became sort of drowsy, though his uh, wife said that uh, she could feed him by mouth. Uh, he was taking food, eating, but uh, his eyes were closed. And then uh, she thought that he was sleeping. On the next morning, he was not getting up. So she brought him uh, to the hospital. And from emergency room, he was directly admitted in the ICU. On admission, he was grade four unconscious. Pass was 100 per minute, blood pressure 160 over 90 millimeter mercury. Uh, patient was uh, dysnic, saturation was 85% with supplemental oxygen 10 liter per minute through face mask. So we immediately intubated the patient and put uh, him on mechanical ventilator. His uh, plantar were bilaterally extensor. ABG, which uh, we did on admission, showed patient had severe hypoxemia with respiratory alkalosis and metabolic acidosis. He had hyperkalemia with raised urea and creatinine level. This was his admission ECG which showed sinus uh, tachycardia with T inversion in lid one and AVL and uh, biphasic P wave in V1. Bedside echocardiography, which was done on the same day, showed concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, enlarged LA, enlarged right atrium and right ventricle, and LV systolic function was good, that is 46%. As the patient was unconscious, so we did brain imaging, which showed brainstem hemorrhage with ventricular extension. On next morning, there uh, we found some changes on the cardiac monitor. So we did an 12 lead ECG, which showed that there was ST depression in lead one, two, three, AVF, and V6. Their uh, biphasic P, uh, P wave was present in V1 and V2. Uh, sir, uh, the case ends here and uh, next I have some discussions. Before going to discussion, should we discuss the ECG of this patient? Yes, Kanesh, I think this is, uh, we should discuss the ECG first. This was his first ECG. The tech you one. What is the pressure level, first day and second day? Blood Sir, his, uh, his blood pressure was maintained all over. Uh, on admission, it was 160-90. And later, it was around 140-90, around that. Achha, Achha, before yes, Rufik, sir, anyone panelist can comment on the ECG? We'll hear the uh, comment from Rufik, sir, after uh, before that anyone panelist. Next ECG. Uh, Khaled, this ECG? This is the, it seems there is a horizontal ST depression. And uh, the patient had uh, tachycardia also. May, one possibility is maybe tachy induced. Now, what is the rhythm? Sinus tachy or the anything else? What is the diagnosis? Yeah. Your tachy diagnosis? Seems to this be sinus, sinus tachy, tachy, actually. Sinus tachy. Yeah. The clear P waves are seen in V1, V2. And then as well as in lead one. There is some hyperkalemia, uh, kalemic type of uh, T wave changes, which was not present in the previous ECG actually. So this is a new change actually, and there is widespread 
ST depression. Uh, so maybe there is some electrolyte imbalance and the patient might have developed from some non-ST elevation MI actually maybe. As the rate is nearly 150, should we consider it as SVT, sir? sir? Anyway, uh -huh, can it be SVT like the active inverted. water? Yes. P waves Sorry? are inverted, which is uh, uh, just not there. Sir, did you see? Yeah, the P waves yes, are inverted in lead, uh, the V1 and V2. In the sinus rhythm, you, if you have noticed, in sinus rhythm, it is upright. And probably has developed some sort of atrial tachycardia. And due to tachycardia, there is the associated ST depression, not due to the ischemia. So but atrial tachycardia. P waves are, P -waves P -waves are uh, In the first ECG, it was also biphasic. Yeah, but this now you can see. Now you can see clearly inverted in V2. If you look at the second ECG, yeah. the P waves are clearly inverted. And Sujib, you... as the rate is nearly 150 yeah. and as a, is there any possibility of atrial flutter? The what, thing, uh, actually, the biphasic P wave in V1, which is clearly seen here, excludes that it could be anything other than sinus origin tachycardia. Uh, uh, Rafik sir. What do you suggest, sir? Sir is out. No. Sir, is so it's tachycardia, no question. It's rate is a little bit over 150, but in V1, it's biphasic. It is true that V2 is biphasic, which was not there before, but is it possible that the lead position is a little different? Uh, that's the possibility. But And the 2, 3 AVF is upright, and 1 is upright, yeah. Um, AVL, I cannot make a comment. So I will consider this a sinus tachycardia. Sinus tachycardia. But the thing is that there is ST depression in V6 and 2, 3 AVF. If you look at the baseline ECG, there is half millimeter ST depression in V6. This patient has hypertension. So I, I, I mean, yes, when there is horizontal ST depression, that can be subendocardial ischemia, but it is possible that LVH-related subendocardial ischemia has been exacerbated by the tachycardia. Jamal was, um, Jamil was pointed and pointing out. Sudeep, do you want to add any comment? Yeah, the differential could be still the actual tachycardia. Uh, and if you look, uh, because uh, why the sorry, why the sinus tachycardia rate? I mean, initially also in the first ECG also there was sinus tachycardia, but here the rate is clearly increased. Still possible that the sinus tachycardia rate has increased, but looking at the morphology of the P in the V2 is clearly pretty much not only biphasic is the the negative component very much. So I still think is the, the possibility of atrial tachycardia. Thank you, Sudhi, for your nice differential diagnosis. So, sir, what we should do, sir, the, in this case, sir, for the practical management purpose, what should we do next, sir? Whether we, uh, is there any, make any difference for the management purpose, sir, the atrial flutter or the atrial take it? Uh, that ECG does not give any the definite uh, clinical differentiation, sir. Well, as Shujib mentioned, I mean, there are only two considerations. One, is right, it an sir. atrial tachycardia? or is it sinus tachycardia, one or the right, other. Sir. Question would be, what was the rate and how did it go up? I think it's very important to look at the pattern of the chain. I mean, if it, if it has gradually gone up from the before and the patient is getting sicker and sicker, and it's more likely point towards sinus tachycardia. If it suddenly increased to this rate, let's say the heart rate before was 90 and suddenly goes to 150, 160, then oh. definitely oh. it's not sinus tachycardia, it's something else. Right. And so the management wise, I mean, I will definitely start with beta blocker first if the blood pressure tolerates to slow the rate down. That will be my first line of treatment. <clears throat> Should I proceed? Yes. yes. Thank you, sir. Uh, now I like to say a few words about acute stroke induced cardiac injury, which is of utmost clinical importance. Uh, some ECG changes and raised cardiac biomarkers are common in case of ischemic stroke and subarachnoid hemorrhage, but it is less frequent in case of intracerebral hemorrhage. 
cardiac injury, any type of cardiac injury following acute pathology of the central nervous system without any evidence of primary cardiac disease may result in structural and functional disturbances, which is uh, known as cerebrocardiac syndrome. And uh, this is mainly caused by the neurogenic stunt myocardial. This is neurogenic stunt myocardium is the sudden onset of myocardial dysfunction, which occur after any acute brain disease from autonomic disturbances. Uh, though the pathophysiology is not uh, clearly defined, it is thought that after the uh, acute brain insult, there is autonomic dysfunction, hyperactivity of the sympathetic system, and there is raised catecholamine level in the blood. It is uh, seen that the catecholamine level raised up to 20 times higher than the normal level. And it causes uh, hypermetabolism and hyperdynamic circulation, which increases the myocardial oxygen demand and uh, causes coronary vasospasm. All this uh, cause cardiac injury. There is also some sort of inflammation mediated myocardial injury, which is caused by the release of uh, some cytokine tumor necrosis factor from the brain which uh, causes the systemic inflammatory response syndrome, damages uh, all, uh, most of the organ, including the heart. And the clinical, typical clinical manifestation are not always present because uh, the sim typical symptom may be concealed by the neurological deficit, especially if patient has some cognitive or language impairment. There may be features of hemodynamic instability, or features of autonomic dysfunction like tachycardia, hypertension, sweating, tremor, etc. There may be some ECG changes like ST deviation, QT prolongation, T wave abnormalities, left ventricular hypertrophy. But unlike the uh, acute coronary syndrome, these ECG changes are usually of short duration. They usually persist for five to 14 days. CKMB may be raised, but uh, there are other causes of raised CKMB other than the cardiac cause. Troponin, uh, cardiac troponin, I and T, these are also raised, but the rise is usually modest, not as high as seen in acute coronary syndrome. And echocardiography may show left ventricular systole dysfunction or sometimes uh, regional wall motion abnormalities. And these features are also of short duration and uh, transient. The management, uh, there is no uh, clear cut treatment uh, available for cerebrocardiac uh, syndrome. Close observation is needed for the first one week. Uh, patients should be evaluated sequentially uh, with day doing daily ECG, cardiac biomarker and echocardiography. Prognosis is uh, usually bad in case of cerebrocardiac syndrome. The mortality is four times higher in patient with uh, cerebrocardiac syndrome than uh, patient who do not have any type of cerebrocardiac syndrome. And uh, it can we can predict the prognosis by uh, seeing the level of the troponin I. If the troponin I is higher, though it is not acute coronary syndrome, but the prognosis is worse. This is a few words about the cerebrocardiac syndrome. Uh, now my uh, next case, a 75 year old male. He was hypertensive on regular bisoprolol and furosemide. He presented uh, in our ICU with restlessness and weakness in the right side of the body and slurred speech since the morning of admission. On admission, patient was drowsy but responded to vocal command. Pass was 96, blood pressure 110 over 70 and saturation was 98% with two liter of oxygen through nasal cannula. This was his admission ECG. Patient uh, had hip surgery done on the same hospital about a year back. And at that time, uh, his ECG was uh, available. At that time, that uh, ECG was uh, sinus rhythm. But in this time, we can see that patient had atrial flutter. Uh, patient's blood pressure was 110 by 80 on admission. Arterial blood, blood gas, uh, CBC, renal function, liver function, all were normal. ECHO, which was done a year ago, showed mild anteroceptal hypokinesia and ejection fraction was 54%. As patient had complained of right-sided uh, 
sorry, left-sided weakness. So we did MRI of brain, which showed acute infarct in right temporoparietal and basal ganglia region with cortical atrophy and ventriculomegaly. After admission on the next day, echocardiography was done, which showed concentric left ventricular hypertrophy, and this time ejection fraction was 59%. We did thyroid function test, which was normal. This was his ECG on third day of admission. On day four, uh, cardiac monitor showed his heart rate uh, was varying from 100 to 120, 140, 160. So the duty doctor uh, took this ECG and uh, he was thinking of uh, atrial fibrillation. So he started injection amiodarone. After giving the loading dose of 150 milligram, this ECG was taken. Uh, then he started the next dose of injection amiodarone, that is 360 milligram. But uh, just after starting that dose, patient developed hypotension. So injection amiodarone was stopped and uh, we have to start injection noradrenaline. After uh, giving noradrenaline for a few hours, his blood pressure was again uh, normal. That is 110 over 70 millimeter of mercury. This was his ECG on day six. Uh, we took consultation from cardiologist as patient was, uh, his blood pressure was normal. His conscious level was improved. So we ultimately shifted the patient from ICU to ward, general ward. So that is the case. Uh, so I have question regarding Ajay. this ECG. Yes, you can ask question. So after giving injection amiodarone, 150 milligram, the first loading dose over half an hour, patient had this ECG. Uh, sir, here, uh, can we call it P wave or still this is the flatter wave? There is uh, two positive waves side by side. What should we call this? Jamil. Sir, uh, unmute, sir Jamil. You, have, un uh, yes, you have to unmute. Jamil. Jamil, sir, you have to unmute. It looks like Q wave. Preceding every QRS complex and it's bifid P wave. Uh, but the duration seems to be normal. So, normal P wave may be bifid. Okay. There is another striking feature that is an acute prolongation of the QT interval. Right, right, yes. exactly. Yes. yes. Induced by the amiodarone. 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 Possibly the patient hypotension, possibly the patient had developed some form of polymorphic ventricular tachycardia or something, torsadis depointis, which might have led to the hemodynamic deterioration. That, uh, otherwise, amiodarone is relatively a very safe drug from a hemodynamic point of view until it induces some form of uh, polymorphic VT. Either VT or profound bradycardia might lead to hypertension yeah. also. Mr. Yes, sir. Sir, after 150 milligram of amiodarone, this was the ECG, na? Yes, sir. Why there was second dose? Uh, sir, duty doctor, uh, this was given uh, by the duty doctor. He was a little bit confused. Usually, we, uh, if the ECG converted to sinus, we usually do, we do not uh, continue the amiodarone. But uh, he continued the injection amiodarone and after uh, just 20 to 25 minutes after starting the second 360 milligram dose, patient developed hypotension. The 360 milligram dose, we usually give it over six hours. But after giving only for 20 minutes, patient developed hypotension. So it was stopped. So Khaled, do we consider this prolonged QT is due to the amiodarone? Uh, it is uh, the most uh, uh, important uh, factor is uh, uh, amiodarone because it has the previous ECG did not show a significant QT prolongation, but there might be other factors as well, like the electrolyte imbalance or myocardial ischemia or some other offending drugs which uh, might have contributed, but uh, it's uh, uh, acutely developed after amiodarone bolus injection. So this is quite obvious uh, at this moment. Maybe, the, sorry, 
Maybe is there Sujib? Sujib Bhandari? Can, can the QT prolongation due to the that insult in the brand itself? Like uh, in the previous slides, he has mentioned that Maybe. It was Maybe. QT prolongation. The yeah. Yes, it, the it can. Yeah. It can be. And and what was the magnesium level of the patient? Was it was it normal? Uh, yes, sir. It was normal. Sujib, do you comment on the P wave again? There is a P wave is V1 is positive, not um, biphasic. And there are some changes are some in the P wave. Changes. Do you have any comment? Uh, P wave looks normal. The P wave duration is also not that broad. Um, yeah. Considering the flutter, if the right atrium or the left atrium is enlarged, it doesn't show the features of the either uh, atrial enlargement. Uh, I think the P wave is normal, except in AVL. If you've seen the AVL, the initial, the first uh, bit of the AVL, that is a slight peaked P wave, which, right, is, right. which could be, yeah, it's in the AVF also. So it's not an artifact. AVF, you can see if you compare. Maybe there's some, um, that that could be a natural ectopic, maybe, I don't know. But the next two uh, P waves looks normal. Actually, the patient is... Kaniz, uh, is the patient too obese? No, uh, not <clears throat> so that much. I think uh, he was a male patient. Height was around five ten, and weight was around seventy kg. Not so that much. Not this much. He has a, a left atrial enlargement, obviously. Could that be a contributing factor for the uh, appearance of the atrial flutter, sir? Can we go back to the ECG before during atrial fibrillation, please? Uh, so this was his first ECG admission on admission. Uh, next one, please. This was on day three. This was yeah. day four. Okay. After uh, doing yeah. this ECG, the doctor gave him injection. Sure, sure. So a few things. So this patient clearly had a stroke, right? Right, sir. Was the patient started on anticoagulation? Uh, sir, I actually uh, consulted this case with uh, Professor Wadud sir and Professor Atharali sir, and uh, we have started uh, anticoagulant at our okay. ICU. Sure. So the, the, the issue is the rate is well controlled in this case for a patient like this. So there is no urgency to convert him. My concern is that First of all, we're discussing what, who, what caused the hypotension. Hypotension was done by the MEO, that can happen. But the question would be that, is there any need to give amiodarone in this patient? Uh, I wouldn't do it because the rate is well controlled. I'll rate control this patient and then let this patient get over the stroke issue and then decide what to do with this atrial fibrillation. The other problem with conversion, the one thing that we worry most I would rather keep this patient in fibrillation because his chance of stroke will be less than if he converts. Because if he's not been adequately anticoagulated long enough and if there is a blood clot, it converts to sinus and strokes again. Um, so that's the other issue. So uh, if we have to go into this issue. Second issue is that if we give amiodarone, is there any need for bolus at all? When will we give bolus? We give bolus when somebody is very sick, somebody is in VT, and we have to make the medicine work very fast. So you have to teach your doctors in the floor that look, uh, what are the conditions that we're going to give IV amiodarone bolus? And that will be not, this is not the patient that I'm going to give bolus. If I have to give amiodarone in this patient, I'll probably start PO, no, not IV. If for any reason I have to start IV on a patient who is hemodynamically stable with atrial fibrillation, which is very rare for us, I'll give the 150 milligram over half an hour, one hour. You don't have to give it over 10 minutes. Uh, or, uh, so that was a pretty big dose of amiodarone uh, to give in a patient. Uh, and also, we also have to understand, I think we, in a patient with stroke, we do not know what the autonomic system is doing we probably don't have much experience. So I, I probably have I, avoided it. I have a comment. Sir, uh, we a give comment. it on over uh, half an hour. Yeah. Uh, Ravik bhai, yeah. can, yes. can, yes. can you hear me? Yes, half is there, we can. Yes. So I have a comment. Maybe uh, uh, you sounded very uh, humble in terms of amiodarone. In this case, uh, I want to be a little more aggressive. 
because we have to have a clear in idea that why we give amiodarone, as you said, for the dream of cardioversion, because the amiodarone cardioversion to sinus rhythm is at best 30 to 40%. And then in the red control situation, we give amiodarone also an IV. In this case, there was no need to give amiodarone. And particularly IV amiodarone in a stroke patient with there is a hemodynamic problem, the stroke may get worse. So I, I don't think that it is a, uh, it is a, it is a situation where we can see, say, we may give amiodarone. I think amiodarone IV is contraindicated <laughs> in, in a situation where the ratio is controlled. I don't know what we are going to achieve by giving amiodarone. Uh, so I don't understand that. So that's why I'm a little aggressive on this that we should be pretty clear in mind. Uh, and you pointed out, Ravik, by that, uh, you know, if you give it, give slowly and whatever, but red control, it does work. But here there was red was already controlled, you know? Yeah. Uh, uh, sir, can I add something? Yes. In our country, we have to deal with two types of patients. One is the rheumatic valvular heart disease patient who have atrial fibrillation and very often young patient come with stroke. In those cases with fast ventricular rate, we prefer control the ventricular rate with the actually uh, digoxin. Uh, in case of uh, ischemic origin or otherwise atrial fibrillation, non-valvular origin, in those cases, for rate control, we prefer amiodarone. And I agree. Oh, uh, sometimes, uh, as Sar was saying, we, in these cases, actually, we want to convert the, it to sinus rhythm. We prefer oral amiodarone so that the, gradually the amiodarone build up. We get the chance of anticoagulation. And we can evaluate the patient, whether the patient have any thrombus or anything. And then can, uh, in time, the patient may convert to sinus rhythm. And as you were saying, it's only around 30%, 30-35%. Yeah. Well, Hafiz has been generous about conversion rate. Conversion rate with intravenous amiodarone or any drug is 10%. Also, we have to remember, new onset atrial flutter fibrillation, 50% will convert without any medicine. Mm. Um, Hafiz has given me more courage to be a little bit more aggressive about amiodarone. We do not use amiodarone for rate control at all, unless I am very stuck. And the situation will be, a patient comes with a blood pressure of 90, atrial fibrillation, rapid ventricular response. I give digoxin and it doesn't go down. I cannot give calcium and spinal blocker. I cannot give beta blocker. I will very cautiously use amiodarone intravenous without bolus. So it is not a drug that we take lightly anymore. Um, so we, we keep that in the arsenal in the back. For rate control, we are not using it at all. So the problem is much more rate controlling drug. The beta blocker, no IV beta blocker available, <coughs> except labetalol, which is not a rate controlling drug. The second is we have digoxy and we have amidon. That's it. So yes. let me let me let me say uh, something about this, Rafik Bai, because. Um, I mean, in cardiology, one thing we are very helpless in a patient with AFib and uh, fast uh, ventricular rate, when the blood pressure is low, cardiomyopathy, and in those situations, uh, we have only two drugs that we can depend on. One is DIG, one is MEO. The problem with the DIG is that it takes six months, even with the IV, to get the rate control. Uh, it, it, you may be lucky, you can give like, and regardless of the renal failure, I'm telling is for the junior physicians. For loading dose, digoxin is okay in renal failure. But after the loading dose for the maintenance, you need to be careful about, about digoxin. And particularly, I would avoid in dialysis patients. You can give one dose and forget about it uh, and do not do maintain. But for the MEO is actually a very good drug in a situation like post cabbage and then uh, in the trauma situation, uh, where there is no other way we can use anything else. And IV amiodarone, we give like a 150 and then repeat the bolus 150 if needed. And, and our experience is that it's a very good rate control drug in those situations. And I agree with Rafik by that I don't use this rampant for everybody with amiodarone, uh, where we can use other drugs. Well, Hafiz, what you said is that you use it 
in special circumstances. Right. It is not a drug of first choice or reflex use of drug. Other point is um, digoxin. Wadud, I'm glad that Wadud mentioned digoxin. Digoxin actually is an underused drug. It is a very good rate control medicine because it does not lower blood pressure. It doesn't do anything else. Um, and even in rare failure patient, we can use it in, in, uh, in, in a controlled fashion. And there was some publicity that digoxin is terrible drug, but uh, there is a recent review and actually, there is a placebo control study which showed that digoxin is still a good drug for, uh, for rate control in, in certain group of patients. But these are all, all has to be customized, um, as you mentioned. But of course, I take your point that when we don't have any other medicine, what shall we use? Um, yes, we have to use it. But we also have to remember that if we find the alternate, we should look for the alternate. It should not be a blanket um, thing that let's use amiodarone. All the, uh, all the time. Rafik, sir, may, may I ask a question to you, please? Yes. Uh, what about the other commonly used agent for uh, rhythm control, like, like sotalol, propafenone, and uh, flecanide for but, conversion of uh, to sinus rhythm? Um, for this patient or in general? In general, actually. Um, in general, the convert. Conversion rate with antiarrhythmic drug in established atrial fibrillation is 10 to 20 percent by by the medicine itself, unless it is paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Um, so, and the other thing, as you, if you look at all the studies, that patient comes to hospital, and if you randomize them, no antiarrhythmic versus antiarrhythmic, you will find that less than seven day duration of atrial fibrillation, majority will convert by themselves, and when we give them medicine, we take credit for it, but I don't think there's any credit to us. It's just a natural conversion of the medicine. But this patient is a, is a difficult patient because question would be whether we really should convert this patient or not, especially in the setting of a stroke. That we have to be careful. Kanis, I think full of answers. But this, Kanis is bringing good cases. This is wonderful because you know, you are really bringing a different perspective of especially this discussion about stroke and troponin. It's a very, very interesting topic. And I'm, I hope that you bring more cases like this because that gives a dimension of cardiology and, uh, and interrelation between specialties. This is wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, this is the, my last case. Yes, please. Unsolved, sir, unsolved mystery. Uh, a 73 year old male patient. He had complaint of parietal bleeding, and uh, he was mainly uh, brought in the uh, gastrology department. It was not in uh, Bardem, it was an outside hospital uh, for doing colonoscopy as outpatient basis. But after colonoscopy, patient became semi-conscious. On examination, his pulse was 48 and blood pressure was 90-50. So he was immediately transferred to our ICU. As I have mentioned that uh, this is a case of unsolved mystery. Uh, we got the patient only for half an hour to one hour time. After that patient uh, party took uh, discharge and respond and uh, take the patient to another outside hospital. Uh, we searched his previous document. He did not have any previous ECG before doing the colonoscopy. Uh, his family gave no history of previous heart disease. And uh, he, this was his ECG. Uh, we labeled him as complete heart block. And uh, as I've said that this is an unsolved mystery, we do not know the fate of the patient. Uh, sir, I have a question that the tall pit T wave, as the patient suddenly became semi-conscious, should we consider it uh, as acute MI complicating the complete, uh, acute MI causing complete heart block? Kadeh, or... before going to your question, I should discuss the ECG diagnosis ECG. first okay, and, yes, and finally 
Now, the aerobic sir will answer lastly, but before that, uh, we should take the comments from our panelist about the ECG diagnosis. Sir, from our panelist, ECG diagnosis. Sir, why can I can Kani, I? Kani is, yes, you can comment. Actually, the patient uh, has a background okay. of uh, right bundle branch block and with uh, uh, probably it is a bifascicular block. And the patient has developed uh, some uh, uh, complete heart block, which is uh, uh, in the background of bifascicular block. Maybe some, um, uh, maybe these are these patients are prone to develop definitely, and uh, particularly under some stressful situation or under some influence of medication. So probably this is the reason. Maybe uh, the patient. They're always vulnerable to develop uh, a, a high degree AV block, the patient with bifascicular block. High degree or a complete heart block, Khalid Bhai? Complete. It is complete. But, huh. but I think there are some evidence of the sinus beat, sinus rhythm. As for example, uh, the lead two, beat one, that is a beat two, and uh, number four, that, that is a number uh, one, two, three, four. These are the sinus bit, I think. As a Rubik's, I will comment. Uh, lastly, what is why? Complete heart block or high degree AV block? Uh, look at the RR interval. It's fixed. Look at the P wave. It's fixed. Look at the association. There is none. So it's complete heart block. And I don't physical block. It's complete right bundle block, block pattern. The point is uh, whether coloscopy has induced any vagal. Uh, increase vagal tone and uh, lead to this problem or not? Yeah. I'm not sure. Uh, so in, in the EKG test, yeah. they actually want you to say that what is the atrial mechanism, what is the ventricular mechanism, and what is the relation between the AV. So it is a perfect example of that, that there is sinus rhythm and there is ventricular mechanism, which is looks like narrow complex, probably junctional escape rhythm. And then there is dissociation, AV dissociation. AV dissociation, I'm telling you for this, does not mean heart block, we all know, because in ventricular tachycardia, there can be AV dissociation, in which case the ventricular mechanism is faster than the atrial, and there is AV dissociation just to make sure that we are on the same page uh, in terms of what we are defining at. Um, about the T inversion is the tall T wave that raises question, is it a hyperkalemia or is it a acute coronary syndrome? I will do that differential. I will not jump on acute MI because it is important that we don't read too much into the EKG and ignore the patient's presentation. Rupik, sir. Um, Kaniz, what medicine did this patient get during colonoscopy? Yes. Uh, sir, some sort of sedative, uh, okay. midazolam and plus minus anything else. Yeah. Uh, they didn't mention okay. the other thing. I think it, it, two, and... two independent issues. One, <clears throat> midazolam use, um, versed and fentanyl can cause uh, impaired consciousness. So that's one issue. Second, this clearly, this is complete heart block. No question about that. And the escape beat is right bundle morphology. And this is typical right bundle morphology. So the escape beat is a junctional uh, escape beat. Because otherwise, if it were event, so the block level is in the AV node level. And <clears throat> so the question is, I don't think this is vagal because vagal episode cannot last for such a long time. Patient was in that colonoscopy place, and by the time came to bar them, I think it was two hours at least. You uh, cannot sir, have a uh, Sir, uh, I see of the same hospital, not in Bardem, but another hospital. But okay. uh, before sending the patient from colonoscopy room to ICU, uh, in the colonoscopy room, they gave patient five or six ampoule of injection atropine. And after yes. that, they sent the patient yeah. to uh, ICU. What? What? But this, this ECG is clearly complete heart block with underlying right bundle branch block. And 
So is it possible that it can happen with acute ischemia? If it happened with acute ischemia, you have to involve the right coronary artery. And you should have seen ST elevation in lead 2-3 AVF. Uh, I think this is just pure conduction system disease. It's probably a coincidence this happened at the same time. I will not let this patient go home and I will not take this patient lightly. How old is the patient? Uh, sir, as I've mentioned, the patient was in uh, our ICU only for uh, 30 minutes to 50 minutes, and later they took discharge on risk bond or uh, discharge against medical advice and uh, went to another hospital. We lost contact with that patient. So what is the age of the patient? Uh, 73. 73. Yeah. 73. I mean, this is the right age for somebody to develop heart block. Uh, it, it can be just that happened at the same time. And the other, uh, did they do any CG before the colonoscopy? No, sir. So it is all also, the you have to understand something that sometimes we have patients in heart block who never came to hospital, never had any symptom. And maybe it happened that, that they got sedation, patient became comatose, and then that's when they found out maybe this is old, who knows? <laughs> if the patient go hypox hypoxic, be become hypoxic or no? Uh, yeah, patient was a little bit hypoxic, not that much. After giving him supplemental oxygen, six liter per minute through face mask, his saturation was 98. But uh, he was uh, respiratory acidosis, type 2 failure. Sir. Yeah, so hypoxia, as we are seeing in the COVID time, is a big trigger also. But another comment is that atropine, if we are giving, how much atropine you need to give in a situation like this, or for that matter, matter any situation, five six ampoules meaning five six milligram. Uh, no, no, one no, no, ampoule has one point six point six point six in one. Also, oh, three milligram given. So three milligram is required to for total parasympathetic blockage. So there is no need to give more than three three milligram of atropine. And in our country, the gastroenterologists don't keep a standby anesthetic during the procedures. They administered these, uh, the fentanyl, the midazolam and propofol by themselves. And whenever they are in trouble, they tend to uh, call an anesthetist or call an intensivist. So this is the usual practice of gastroenterology in this country. So, uh, let me tell you what is the practice here because we <laughs> use midazolam and fentanyl on our own and that is called the moderate sedation. Propofol is labeled as deep sedation and we do not administer that. And you know that propofol administration by someone for, what is his name, the rock star? Uh, Michael Jackson. Uh, Michael Jackson. So uh, you got into trouble uh, with, the, with the propofol injection at home because propofol is a brilliant drug in terms of switch on, switch off but it can have severe consequences also, which unfortunately uh, Michael Jackson had. Well, I think Khaled Moshin, the midazolam and fentanyl are given by non-anesthesiologists in United States also. However, we have a training program. We call this conscious sedation training and I have to take this exam every two years. If I do not pass that exam, I cannot give that. And in this, I think this is something that you need to consider in Bangladesh. What is happening, what happens is that we, we have set up questions, we, uh, there is a curriculum and you read it, it's an open book exam. I take it every two years at, in conscious sedation. And then you know exactly what to do. Uh, in this, how much to give, how frequently to give, what are the protocols? It's, it's a very clearly set up protocol. I think that it is important to set it up uh, so that it will keep people out of trouble um, when they're giving sedation. And this patient was not, clinically, this patient was not a mind. Uh, I think this patient probably has some uh, hypoxia or, you know, vagal is a good theory, but I usually entertain vagal as Rafik I said in the post cath or all that, one time short lived. If it is a second time, I tell the fellows rule book is forget about vagal. Think about groin complications, you know, retroperitoneal, this, that. Uh, because it's, it, we have to, these are the things that we should not compromise because this is patient safety issues. 
thank you thank you sir that's uh, all from my side and i'm grateful again to the ecg study group for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, among all the renowned cardiologists and learn so much from them thank you sir thank you thank you from all of us atar bhai yes uh, thank you ganesh padma for your excellent presentation Sir, one more ECG from Orun Maski. Then we'll move to Orun Maski. Orun, can you share? Today, Hafiz Bhai is going to show us something. Yes, yes. If 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 there is time. Then. After this ECG. And this Orun Maski's presentation is for Hafiz Bhai, really. Dr. Arun Maski, mute yourself. Arun, unmute, please. Yeah. Last time we had a very beautiful lectures on STEMI and culprit lesions. So I came to this case, one lesion. So I think it's for a learning purpose. I have a question for you, even before you start. Yes. This Shahid Shahid Gongalal National Heart Center. This Shahid means like what we martyr. know in martyr. Martyr. Oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. There are many words like Bangla. Uh, Bangla words almost similar meaning in Nepal. Nepali wow. language. Okay, this was a 51 years old male. He was obvious, no other risk factors. In the early morning, he was attending one social function. At that time, he had a chest pain. So he went to nearby local clinic did an ECG. And because there was only uh, staff doing ECG, and there was something changed in ECG, he was referred to a cardiologist for opinion. And after that period of time, he felt better. So he went back home, had his food, relaxed there, and had a chest, uh, again, his chest pain started becoming a little worse. So the, in the afternoon, he attended the hospital. He's doing okay? So this is the EKG of this patient. So what we can see here is sinus rhythm. There's a elevation in two, three AVF and four, five, V4, V5, V6. So this is his uh, right-sided lead. Nothing much in our V3 or V4. Yeah. And the, this is a uh, posterior leads, the uh, seven, eight, and nine. There's some minimal ST change uh, elevation in uh, posterior leads. So, so, what is the culprit lesion in this stigma? So, this is a uh, baseline ECG. To me, it seems to be might be a dominant circumflex artery was occluded. Yeah, because uh, it's an inferior lateral lead. Yeah, inferior and lateral. And not much changes in one avial. Yeah. And it's very difficult to say which one, which of the leads is has high higher ST elevation compared to two and three. And if you consider the lateral leads, uh, possibly we should consider. V4 is more. Posterior uh, lead, look at the V2. Taller, upright T. So this is a posterior leads. Yes. 789. Tall R in V7, uh, 8, and 9. Some ST elevations. So it's also possible the circumflex and dominant circumflex, you know. Dominant circumflex. And the other possible yeah. is, is a, it's a rare. But it is possible that the right is occluded from before, and the LAD is has now new lesion. 
that can give you this kind of scenario. But I am worried about this. You know, this so what is the culprit lesion is a big question before cath and even after cath. And I'll, I'll, and I'll show you my first EKG uh, when I have a chance. But this patient is in trouble because look at this. It is an inferior STEMI, we all agree, infralateral. And there is not a dominant um, R and then T upright and posterior. We worry about, you know, RV. But then why this sinus tack? Uh, this is... This is kind of interesting to me that why is the sinus tag? That may be a big area, impending heart failure yes. uh, and mechanical complications. All these needs to be taken into consideration. Any inferior MI with sinus tag raises these problems, as uh, Asan Bhai was saying. Yeah. This history is interesting. Nine AM, he had chest pain, goes, uh, subsides, does ECG goes home, relaxes, feel discomfort, then afternoon he visits. Now, let's right. see. So this was the initial ECG when he first visited a uh, uh, local clinic at 9 a.m. But you can see he has uh, lead two, three, and AVF. This S elevation and V4, V5, and V6. But look at V2. V1, V2 should not be showing very good uh, uh, T waves. Any upright T waves in the background of chest pain, I always uh, look for posterior lead involvement. I would always ask for posterior lead. Yeah, we had done that posterior lead. There was uh, minimal ST elevation in V1, so V2, with this and V3. He, he yeah. went home? He went no, home no. with this? No. Yeah, with this EKG, EKG was done in local uh, clinic with in the 9 a.m. there was no doctors. So the, oh, the right. person who did his uh, case, he said, go and visit your cardiologist. After some time, he felt better, so he went back home. <laughs> and in the afternoon, he had uh, chest pain. And then he visited uh, another local hospital. And this is a ECG with sinus tachycardia. Maybe in V3, some ST elevations. V3 to V6 with uh, sinus tachycardia. Otherwise, he was hemodynamically stable. Yeah. Oh, so we did an angiogram. So this is a right coronary. Doesn't look anything. Looks okay. And this is his uh, left uh, system. Circumflex looks fine. There's a thrombotic occlusion of proximal mid junction LED. And if you look at this distal LED, it's occluded here. This is another view showing thromotic occlusions. And this is uh, another view showing occlusion, thromotic occlusion in proximal mid junctions and did a primary PCI to LED with DS. So this was a picture of uh, this patient. He had a mild, uh, he was a known case of uh, renal impairment. His creatine, baseline creatinine was around 1.6, 1 1.7. And after uh, doing a PCI, we did, we just tried to see the wall motion in the cat lab, then an echo, we showed uh, wall motion abnormality in anterior wall, anteroceptal and apical area. This was a, a, a echo done post PCI in the cat lab itself. So uh, for learning, if you find any angiogram by uh, thrombus in angiography or imaging that, I mean, proof this is a case of acute myocardial infarctions. And immediately post PCI in the CCU, there's still ST elevation in two, three AVF and persistent ST elevation in V3 to V6. 
next uh, post, uh, next day, the ST elevation has now up to V2. So still ST elevation in V2, lead two, three AVF, V2, two, V6. And this morning, the same, yeah, it's easy. Otherwise the patient is hemodynamically uh, stable. His uh, renal impairment has uh, deteriorated now the around 2.5, 2.6. Now just for a brief uh, academic interest, if you have a ST elevation more than, more in lead three compared to two and ST depression one AVL, that's RCA. And if you see two is more than three and ST elevation, that's a circumflex. And this is how you find out if the, in case of RV infarction, whether this is a proximal or distal R, uh, RC occlusion, if there's a ST elevation, then it's a proximal. If no ST elevation, this, then this, uh, this is a distal RC occlusions. And if you find ST depression more than one mm in RV4, that in, indicates circumflex occlusions. I'm not going to in detail of this one. So this slide is very important. If you find any uh, patients with occlusion in before the first uh, diagonal, then there's a ST elevation in one and AVL. If it's uh, occlusion occurs in LED before main septal, then there's a ST elevation in V1, V2, and ST depression in inferior leads, two, three AVF, V5, and V6. So if there's occlusion between first septal and diagonal, there's no ST elevation in V1. So if there's ST elevation V1, it indicates a septal glands are occluded. If there's a proximal occlusion, proximal to first septal and D1, there's a ST elevation in V1, V4, as mentioned earlier, and there's a reciprocal ST depression in inferior leads. If there's a distal LED occlusion, distal to first septal and first diagonal, then V1 or AVL are spared, and there's no ST, a reciprocal ST depressions. Sometimes we have a very long LED which wraps around the uh, around the inferior uh, wraps the, the type four LED which wraps around the apical area and if it sub supplies significant portion of the inferior wall and its occlusion uh, causes the inferior ST elevation uh, MI in inferior ST elevation in two three uh, in AVF so this distal LED occlusion may be deceptive. So what we find here is we do not find any uh, changes in one AVL V1. So it uh, virtually excludes this is a proximal occlusions. There's excavation in V2, V3, lead two, three, and AVF, and in four, five, and six. So if you look at this uh, angiogram here, there's a distal occlusion here, and post PCI also there's a apical area. So in this, uh, there's a occlusion in the distal LED. So we did not try to open that LED because it looks like very small. So that may be one of the reason why the persistent ST elevation is there. So the culprit lesion was LED. It was a thrombotic occlusion distal to first diagonal. Hence the septal branch of LED was not involved and there was a large distal occlusion of LED. This was supplying significant portion of inferior wall. So the culprit lesion was LED, but the area of supply was very large and the LED was wrapping distally. So ST elevation was there in inferior leads. And the distal vessels was not open in this patient. So persistent ST elevation in inferior leads could be the reason of why, because there was a distal occlusion. Thank you. Thank you, Arun, for a very interesting case. But honestly, this is not surprising because uh, the, the wraparound LED sometimes gives this ST elevation in the inferior. We call it distant ischemia, giving rather injury type. So even in the EKG uh, question book, this uh, division with the prox LED versus mid LED or the prox RCA versus mid RCA, all these have we taken out because these are all good to know from the EKG, but you can't really bet on this uh, with the with the territory 
uh, not always be consistently right. So I am not that emotional about just EKG dictating everything. Uh, we see surprises and that is not, un, uh, not is not sort of uh, uh, rare. That's very common. But one comment on this, that in a situation when you don't restore the distal apical uh, flow, I usually tweak with the wire and with the balloon uh, doddering and then see there is a significant microvasculature problem or not, which clearly in this case has. Uh, and then I try to give medications that help microvasculature. If the EDP is high, still having chest pain, balloon pump, if the EDP is not high and then we can give, you know, the uh, glycoprotein 2B3 inhibitors. And uh, before leaving the lab, we dump like adenosine or, nic or nicardipine or verapamil, depending on what we have, and then see how much we can restore. Because clearly there was ground glass appearance also, and you showed in the echo that there was epical and um, mid anterior wall uh, significant hypokinesis. Uh, but uh, she's on dual antiplatelet, of course, and then see how she does. And Mario described this, you know, RCA versus circumflex, you know, which one is prominent and all that, but it, it doesn't have any real practical value, really. Prognostically, if you get any patients with proximal LED, then it should be more accuracy because outcomes are worse. That's very important. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, in the setting of anterior wall MI, in the setting of anterior wall MI, the you know, the prox LED we define by where is the septal coming from, right? We, I, I, you know, this is a sky definition that before this septal perforator is prox. But the question is not that. Question is, what is the lesion where that, uh, how much muscle is at geopardy? I mean, who cares about septal perforator coming early or late, but the question is how much muscle as geopardy depending on the location of the lesion. I go by that and that makes more sense. But by definition, when we define the segments of the LAD, we call <coughs> septal perforator as the prox. And then septal perforator to the, uh, to the uh, bending of the knee type is the mid and then this distal following that. Uh, Arun, can you unshare? Yeah. Atar bhai. Thank you very much, Arun Maski, for your excellent presentation at the case discussion. So we have uh, two more presentations from Rufik sir and Sudhuri Hafiz. Sir. Please. Hello, Rufik sir. Hafiz, should we start with Hello. Hafiz? Okay, sir. So, the Hafiz, right? Can you see my uh, slides now? Uh, we see your screen. You have to double click on the ECD base, EKG basics. Is it loading now? And uh, not yet. Oh. <laughs> you can see the long way off. <laughs> Oh no, it, I, it, it doesn't go there? Not yet. Okay, let me share again. Have you paid the internet? Yes, I had yes. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. yeah. Yes, now. Can you see the EKG now? Uh, five. Yes. All the slides are seen together. Now, now, now it's... Uh, double click, please. Okay, all right, good. Now you can see, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is a quick one. 
uh, just this morning I got this EKG, a 64 year old or something, uh, a Turkish lady visiting Las Vegas, uh, chest pain and came to the emergency room. History of hypertension, is sm remote smoking, no other significant comorbidities, blood pressure like 180 over 100, and then this EKG. Um, I just uploaded this when I was looking at Dr. Uh, Arun Maskey's uh, presentation because this has relevance. Mm -hmm. So inferior mm -hmm. ST elevation, and then there is precordial ST changes, right? True. So any, any guess? I mean, this patient was uh, uncontrolled hypertension, EKG, and the clinical presentation consistent with STEMI, and we agreed to go to the cath lab. But just before the going to the cath lab, any other thought? Chest X-ray normal, pulse ox good. Any so uh, we were good. Uh, it was uh, it was like uh, 52 minutes when we are in the cath lab from the initial door. So we are good time. 90 minutes, you know, we have enough uh, for the cricket lovers. We have uh, 12 more uh, overs and enough batsmen on hand, no no rush. All predictable, we are going to win this 90 minutes dot to balloon, everything good. And then trouble comes. <laughs> so what so, we are expecting, that is the LED proximal lesion type for LED. Type for LED, right? Okay, anyone for uh, inferior, there is inferior changes. You ignore that or it is the uh, musky Mas situation that there is a wraparound LED giving the RCA problem. Just Dr. Professor Maskey just showed. What do you think? Yeah, that's what now we think. That may be a possibility. That's a possibility. Okay, so. I for LED. And yes. another, possibility, another possibility is sometimes some patient have a large and long diagonal that goes from lateral to up to the inferior surface. And in that yeah. case, occlusion before that diagonal may give rise to this kind of uh, ECG changes. Okay, so energy. let me let me try, walk back a little bit um, because I always talk to Dr. Narula, who is my mentor, uh, about this plaque rupture, plaque erosion, and and uh, activation of the coagulation cascade and the acute coronary syndrome. And uh, he and Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Birmani from Armed Forces Institute of Pathology in Bethesda, Maryland showed that all these macro vessel events happen in the proximal third or proximal half of the three major epicardial vessel. And therefore, if you get a diagonal STEMI, it's, it's not common, it's rare. Uh, and that diagonal STEMI usually is uh, a big Diagonal. Sometimes we call it like dual LED type. That yeah. both diagonals are in a dual LED type. So diagonal or a PL branch STEMI is is not that common. Very very rare. So this uh, this patient had a, a right coronary that is about 95% uh, good flow, big, but anomalous suck coming from the right, <clears throat> then giving the uh, Ramus branch and also a, 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 a another branch almost going into the midway to the LAD and then uh, the couple of OM branch and the LAD is about uh, 1.5 vessel that suddenly stops at the mid segment. And I don't know whether the LAD is the culprit or, or the RCA is the culprit. I struggled to get a good view of the circumflex. Um, and uh, I see that there is no major uh, stenosis in the anomalous circumflex. Question now. And now, you know, this whole uh, T20 cricket, which was almost in my hand, I'm losing time uh, for the door to balloon. Uh, so, uh, so I fixed the RC, I called the surgeon because initially my gut feeling was that what about the LAD? And the SARC may have lesions. So I called them, but I took more pictures and then I, uh, 
I realized that the circ is good. LED may be ill-formed or maybe occluded, who knows? I fix the RCA, control the blood pressure, uh, check the EDP and see whether we need a balloon pump or not. And EDP was normal, patient pain got better. Luckily, we had a resident who speaks Turkish language. So I called her and then uh, she was giving you know, good feedback. And then we did not go after the LAD and we'll see how it goes. Because my gut feeling is that the LAD is probably ill-formed. The RCA is huge with the PDA and going almost to the uh, meet into the apex of the LV. Uh, and I did a LV gram and there is uh, no uh, 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 anterior wall, wall motion abnormality. Apical has some wall motion abnormality. So let's see how it goes. Okay. So let me go and show you. Yeah. Can you see the angiograms? Oh, <laughs> I was trying. <laughs> I will show you next time because I had to copy it, but, uh, and then the fellow uh, was not helpful because uh, the patient uh, family came in and they were dragged by the family. So they could not make the CD for me. So uh, I'll show you, I promise, uh, interesting. Um, this, this is a, a, maybe 10 minutes, a 74 year old uh, with history of severe chest pain and dizziness and call 911. That was from uh, about a couple of weeks ago when I wanted to show you, but my sound system was not working. So this is the EKG. What, what is, can you read the uh, uh, options? Yes. Can, can, uh. Who? STEMI, complete heart block and temporary wire and angiogram. STEMI and 421 block, atropine and lytics and cath if lytics fail, atropine IV and dopamine IV, and then do echo, cath and revascularize if troponin comes significantly positive, isoproteinol infusion and echo assessment. Now, these are not my made up uh, options. These things were discussed on the night because uh, I just wanted to tease the EP guys. An EP guy was on call and he said uh, that, uh, that you can do this, you can do that. And they confused the senior oh. fellow. And the senior fellow did not call me, call me like six o'clock in the morning. And, they, and he was telling me all these options. And I said, okay. So I just put those options for you. And they were worried about COVID, honestly. And they, they send the COVID test. And because there are some so-called chest infiltrate and one pulse ox showed pulse ox like 93, the, everything else was like 95% or above. But they, that's what they are thinking about what to do. Uh, but I did not put that. I just wanted to see what do you think. And then we'll show you. What do, what do you think? We should take to the cath lab or give lytics or what? So you have the cath lab on the way. Cath lab is okay, no problem. Logistically, no problem. Uh, option A would be my choice. STEMI and complete heart block, temporary wire and cath. Yeah. Okay. Anyone yeah, else? How is the STEMI? How can I say ST elevation is not there? Okay. Um, we it would a, argue. It is acute coronary syndrome, no doubt, but not STEMI. I can say STEMI as yes. uh, even in lead two, it's not more than half millimeter. Actually, also, you agreed for a STEMI. So, what is your call? Lead, lead three and APF showing some ST elevation. That's the point. Uh, but it's not more than a half millimeter. Okay, so Probably. excellent point. And that's why I'm showing this. This half millimeter, one millimeter, all these are relevant when you are like, I call this, this uh, the 
clinical presentation is iffy, but the EKG is florid, then go for it. If the e clinical presentation is iffy, EKG is iffy, iffy plus iffy is more iffy. But here, the clinical presentation is overwhelmingly in, uh, going in the direction of inferior. So this magnitude of half, and this is also relative. Look at the QRS complex in the 2-3 AVF. The relative uh, the, uh, amplitude is not that big. So all these guidelines writers, they give you guidelines. But if the clinical is convincing, this is inferior wall MI with the blood, you know, complete heart block. What you are waiting for? So that's my point that should not be doing this isoprotrenol business and then dopamine business because the patient has chest pain and EKG changes. And look at the uh, other, uh, is, you know someone by the company it keeps. Look at the company, it is ST changes in the precordial legs, right? The, the precordial is ST changes, there is no other explanation. This uh, T wave is ugly and there is no you know, intracranial hemorrhage or trauma or any other big issues to explain this. And the patient is having chest pain. So I told the fellow that do not do this kind of all night, this kind of problem, you know? So <clears throat> I would not take anything other than A, STEMI and complete heart block, temporary wire and cap. These, these uh, patients with the, with the dopamine and isoprotrenol and rovic bike can jump. I don't like them managed with this, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, Zol pad standby, or even sometimes, uh, you know, percutaneous like uh, the, uh, the skin Zol pad with the uh, patient jerking movement and, and paste. Um, and then giving dopamine as backup. I think that's, we need to forget those. Rafik Bhai. Sorry, you have to unmute. Uh, yeah, I mean, those choices are ridiculous choices for me because somebody <laughs> comes with an episode of, no, no, simple as that. Somebody comes with a syncope because the patient fell down. And if you ask the patient in the history, did you remember falling down? Answer will be no. That means the patient had a syncope and complete heart block. Before you decide anything else, you put a temporary pacemaker in that patient. Number one. Second question, half is this question will be cath or not. Yes, there is a subtle ST elevation. Um, in, it's not very clear, but so a cath thing is not about, probably I'll do that. But no question about temper. I will not go for atropine transcutaneous space. Transcutaneous space, if the patient is in the ambulance, I will do that transcutaneous. But that's painful. If the patient is awake, I will not put a transcutaneous spacer. I'll just put a temporary pacemaker in this patient. So by the time uh, I was called, the dopamine was 7.1. We did cath. But what do they stay on the case? Because this is the cath. <laughs> what do you do next? The, the coronaries are fine. Coronaries are fine. So I usually routinely do a, a ventriculogram proper, not like hand injection, proper ventriculogram. When we have an issue like this, remember that I call cath lab the Supreme Court of, of cardiology. You go through every data, echo everything. But if you're not sure, decide whatever you need to do. And this is a clearly a Takasubu pattern on the ventriculogram. So it was uh, interesting back because in the COVID time, um, this was classic Takasubu presenting with complete heart block, very rare in the literature, but uh, here we go. Um, and, the, and the, let me tell you uh, another patient, uh, it is important to, to recognize 54 year old admitted with COVID. The previous patient actually lucky that COVID was negative, uh, but Regardless, as you know from the literature, that in the COVID time, the incidence of Takasubu has gone up, regardless of the presence of the COVID or not. This is a patient with COVID, 54 year old, and EKG was like this uh, in the beginning of his uh, disease in the hospital. This is like day three of COVID. Sinus stack, PVC, okay? 
And then uh, day 12, he developed respiratory decompensation and EKG now is this. What do you do now? The options are on the right. And please actually commit yourself to this. So what do the, I actually argued very vigorously with the American College of Cardiology that if you have everything ready in the hospital, it just hurts me to give lytics in a place where there is cath because for the PPE and for the protection of the healthcare workers, get the protection and do the cath. And now you know the SEC has changed. There is no lytics role uh, in terms of uh, alternative to cath. Uh, when the cath is available. Uh, this is very important because if we don't recognize, we'll be giving lytics unnecessarily and probably wrongly to some of the patients. So this patient had this ST elevations and then question is uh, whether you give lytics or do echo and assess and then avoid cath or cardiac cath, revascularize or give lytics and cath if fails. I would go for echo because a ST elevation in interceptal, if it clearly involves V1 to V4, then there should be reciprocal changes in the inferior leads, ST depression, but it's not there. Okay, so the- uh, Equal assessment and then decide about get. Right, so, but uh, let me tell you about the uh, reciprocal changes. The reciprocal changes is important to see, but in the absence of reciprocal changes, I would not, disagree that this is not a STEMI. Uh, but if you get it, you are, you are good. But if you don't get it, it's not a must. To, not. And in the guidelines, you also see that. Uh, and the other important thing is that, what is the clinical presentation? Patient is profoundly hypoxic and, and decompensated because of that. Can that be an issue? Uh, and, and, the, and the hospital has cat lab and everything. So do what is best for the patient. That's my point to the fellows. So any vote on this? Can we take a vote? I think yes. who can nothing we? is right or wrong here. Just a poll, please. Ribu, can we have a poll? Uh, yes, sir. We are giving it, sir. Give us a few seconds, sir. So by this time, uh, Dr. Hafiz, yeah. It is a, a day 12 BCG. What happened up to by day one to day 11? So the, the patient is COVID, right? And the uh, patient COVID. has uh, this COVID that's uh, chest infiltrate. They're giving antibiotics. They did procalcitonin and he's not ready to go home. So he was in the hospital. And then day 12, and we also do this uh, as, as you are doing also, look at the inflammatory markers, D-dimer, and, uh, and then see the chest infiltrate. And we also do high resolution CT to see the degree of yeah, hypoxia. Pastor, answer please. Uh, should we go for 30 seconds? Yes, 30 yeah. seconds. Okay. So those are the things that was happening. And then at day 12, he likes, okay. So B and C, cardiac cath and revascularization, yeah. Uh, and as always, uh, I am more with, uh, with, uh, with Wadud. Uh, but um, I was called in um, after the patient was in the cath lab and uh, they told me that uh, patient already taken to the cath lab. So I said, okay, <laughs> I did not agree um, because that could have been avoided. But I'm actually very against to give lytics in these patients because some of the uh, uh, cardiologists in, even in Las Vegas argued that we should be giving um, lytics, uh, but I am dead against that. Uh, so just to show you the cath, the uh, cath uh, was okay. And, and again, I did a ventriculogram. Any comment on this ventriculogram?
because you saw the last echo and you are seeing this one. This is actually a variant of Takasubu. Compared to last one, which is classic, there is anterobasal, posterobasal hyperkinesis, and there is dyskinesia and aneurysm of the whole anteroepical and infraepical wall. Here, look at that, the apex moves, apex actually, actually uh, moving well, and then the anterobasal posterior basal moves, but the mid segment is dyskinetic, mid segment. This is the mid segment a variant of Takasubu. And uh, we actually published uh, from the echo also that what are the variants and how you can do uh, from the echo and then uh, uh, define from the echo. Um, and we gave the steroids and tocilizumab and the patient did well. So, uh, and I'll take two more, maybe five more minutes. Any questions on this so far? No, excellent. Patient, patient did very well. So 71 year old with history of cabbage, ischemic cardiomyopathy admitted for uh, fatigue and then found uh, renal failure and patient has an ICD. And this is for, for Rofik Bai. This patient went into this rhythm and oh my God, I was challenged with these possibilities in the floor. The ICD did not go off. So this is not likely to be VT. Uh, please don't laugh. The ATP therapy should always be able to terminate if programmed correctly. So oh. the, I, have, I have scientists in my team. So uh, they come up with all these propositions. So I'm just uh, giving you the propositions what the fellows and the residents argued with me. Give beta blocker IV and then treat VT, proceed with CAF. Okay. What do you, what do you, what, let's take a vote. Rafik Bhai, you want any comment before the vote? I know this is your favorite topic. <laughs> Rafik Bhai, maybe mute. No, 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 I'm fine. No, no, let's look at the answer, what the, what the audience okay. say. Sorry, Rohit, but I just, okay. That's very good. So do you want many make, do you want to make a comment, Rohit, by what this other scientist? I mean, well, this, this, is stupid. This, this is ventricular tachycardia. I mean, there's no question about it. The question is why did not the ICD treat it? Because the rate is 150, probably it was not programmed right. Yeah. So that was the problem with this ICD. Uh, most ICDs, a lot of physicians program it single zone. Um, and this is a VT of 150 base per so it just didn't um, detect it. And the That's ATP the therapy, the ATP therapy was there, but ATP but, may not work, right? No, no, no. That's not true. Question is, what was the rate cutoff for the VT detection? Yeah. This so VT no, right. is 150. Yeah. So, so most of I, the ICDs are programmed around 170, 180. This is about 150. So probably it was below the rate cutoff. So he did not see it at all. And actually I showed you one case before that the ATP was 150. This was like a VT like 120, so it did not terminate. In this case, the ATP was actually a higher rate, but what I'm saying that ATP, even if it is programmed, it may not be 100% successful or it uh, may be programmed lower. And then uh, this patient had uh, this patient had a cabbage, I told you, I, like my, this is the question that I have for Rafik Bhai, that we did the cath and we found that there is a high grade stenosis in the Lima to LAD beyond the anastomotic site, we fixed that. Okay, so then, then do you continue with any anti-arrhythmic or just uh, the ischemia, anti-ischemic therapy is the best anti-arrhythmic? Well, the VT has nothing to do with this stenosis. VT <laughs> happened simple as that. Because acute ischemia does not cause VT. Acute ischemia causes ventricular fibrillation. So this patient has a substrate. This patient has a substrate. I mean, good that you did the cath and yeah. you fixed the vessel, uh, which emanate. But 
it, it will be de it will totally depend on so, so Ravi bhai I'll tell you what happened next so i fixed this and we did get any, we did not give any any order or anything uh, and our ep guy says follow up with him we'll map it and do vt ablation if if there is recurrent yeah if there is recurrent i told yes. him i told him this i said i will follow up the patient and i will give it to if it recurs but yes. i have given him anti ischemic therapy because this is monomorphic probably scar related right yes this is scar related vt one of the thing you can make it worse by giving antiarrhythmic because yes. what will happen this vt is now 150 if you give them antiarrhythmic it will become 120 and then you will not be able to program the ICD to such a low cutoff. Yeah. I will not give enter make just follow this patient with the programmed ICD. Now we always fight with you, Rafik, by the EP guys and interventionalists. What about beta blocker? Beta blocker is given, yeah, carbidolol, you know, because of the part of the cardiomyopathy, you know, we uptighted that other. Uh, but I always argue that, you know, this polymorphic VT by rule is ischemia and monomorphic is scar. I get that, but many patients after treating this monomorphic VT with ischemia treatment, they don't recur and we just sit tight. What, what ischemic, what, which medicine? Well, it, in ischemia means we fix the Lima to LID. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> well, the, the, whole, the whole point is that maybe this patient was getting VT once a year, once every two years. Right. So how do you know that this, this, uh, um, stenting, preventing the VT. We don't know that. That's why it will be, and, and, and nobody has done a study on that. But the question right. would be, right. if there is a vessel to be stented, if you believe that area is ischemic, sure. Um, it, it is worth angioplasting that patient. I mean, if somebody comes with VT, we always do that. But this is different rhythm now. Yeah. Now, this is a 23 year old with twin pregnancy, 39 weeks, and then had cardiac arrest, ambulance went there. And the first thing they recorded is this. This is from the ambulance. This is like about uh, 10 days ago. Um, VIFI shown here, and then return of spontaneous circulation. And then patient got intubated. She had the following labs, abnormal liver function test, low platelets, hemoglobin 7.2. And then in the EKG in the emergency room, was this uh, post cardiac resuscitation EKG, a STEMI activated from the emergency room, and and we were called in, and and now what? And I give you these possibilities because uh, this case actually I was involved from the beginning, um, not very beginning, but um, not too late. Uh, and I'll tell you what I did. The possibilities are STEMI activation, AGRI, and lytics. STEMI activation, activation, AGRI, and proceed to cath lab with radiation protection, supportive care, and assess with echo, correction of metabolic derangement, OB consult, emergency C-section, and uh, I can't read. Uh, <laughs> okay and then uh, correct the metabolic derangement. What do you think? The best course for the patient. Any comment from any faculty while we are working? Any question about the patients? So- the Two, I do not agree at all. With that? E, we can have some choice. Okay, uh, you can propose E, Odud. This <laughs> way. C, C and D. Yeah. Hey, yes, Khalid Bhai. This may be a help syndrome with C and D. Yes. Okay. So health for sure, right? Yeah. Abnormal LFT. Then patient had hypertension during pregnancy. And, from have, uh, and the low platelets, but low. hemoglobin is low. So yeah. health syndrome. I think. I think first thing this. In this situation, we all need to be clear that lytics is, I will fail and I'll go after the uh, 
the fellow, if the patient fellow even says lytics, thankfully no one said that. Okay, that's good. Uh, and then this patient had C-section in the emergency room. I told them do the C-section in the emergency room. And uh, they looked at me and they were like, oh, am I an idiot? But the high risk OB luckily is a good doc. And I told them, so they did the emergency C-section in the OB. We, we corrected this uh, metabolic derangement, a little bit of acidosis. I told them this is not a STEMI EKG uh, for sure. Um, and I, then patient, uh, I did, I deactivated. Can there be spontaneous dissection of the coronary artery as well? That is possible because if it is a STEMI, that's the only explanation, correct, uh, um, Khaled? Because, yeah. uh, because in this patient, if you are thinking atherosclerotic plaque rupture, then I think we will not look good. It has to be dissection. The question is, if it is aortic root looks good, and then the inferior uh, uh, situation is uh, ST segment is rather depression, right? Oh. Yeah. All right, and then, um, Hafiz. Yeah. Talk to me, oh. somebody like talk to somebody like me and the young doctors that are listening. Yeah. Who does yeah. not do much cat. If I am a, if you didn't give me the history of this ECG, oh, okay. yeah. how am I going to read this ECG? Oh. There is S2 elevation in lead AVR. Yes. S2 elevation in lead V1. Yeah. And diffuse ST depression. Yep. What will you call this? What okay, will you so think? If, if there is no history given, and yes. this is one of the perfect examples that clinical context is important before we finally interpret. But when we don't have clinical info, we can always give differential. The differential is AVR ST elevation with ST segment depression in the 2-3 AVF. And as you said, minimal ST elevation in the V1. That is observation. Now, what are the possibilities that this scenario can present to us? One, it can be left main disease. But well, in, the, in the case of left main, the ST segment usually is not the shoulder down type in the lead AVR, okay? So this is goes against that, but we need to think about that this is a possibility. Other possibility, pulmonary embolism can give that. Profound hypoxia can give that. This uh, ST segment uh, uh, elevation in the AVR. Profound, yeah. has, has, profound acidosis and hypoxia can give that. So yeah. unless we know the clinical context, we should not jump. That and this well, is how, left main. What, what was the final that what happened to the patient? Okay, so patient got the C section and uh, and then was admitted in the um, in the uh, uh, CCU and then a day later, this is the EKG. All those changes gone, no cath done. And now the question is how you go from here. What was the age of the patient? The echo done, EF was like, patient age is 23, EF is like 45%. But remember that was like um, on arrival, uh, like uh, within hours of arrival, the, the EF was little down. He, her first incentive was ventricular fib uh, uh, fibrillation or polymorphic VT. This one? No, the first one, the before that. Polymorphic VT, yeah. Polymorphic yeah. VT. Yeah. There is QT prolongation in this patient. Absolutely brilliant. Yes, it is QT prolongation. And we, we, we thought that this is long QT related, but the question is uh, why the long QT and is it acquired or is it congenital? Uh, what about the last one, ECG? Last ECG. Uh, should I start the poll? No, 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 no. I don't think that I have any. Uh, oh, okay. You, you showed the poll. QT Pro. The poll was good, actually. Yeah, showed the poll, yeah. Trophic way. So my point is that this long QT during this episode and then this EKG, are you convinced that QT is now still prolonged or little less? QT is prolonged. 
but i have to also ask for the level of uh, potassium and magnesium look at b3 there is t web e uh, web is there these actually t u webs graphics sir are these t u webs no no actually this is the meeting point of the t and uh, t and p webs no u webs is there I mean, it probably is by feed. I mean, if you look at V one, it V two, it looks like E wave. But if you look at V six, um, it's different. So there's, a, I think it's a TU complex. TU complex. But, yes. Yeah. Look like long. we actually called it TU Ravik Bhai, and despite the correction of everything, that QT is still kind of prolonged. Yeah. Uh, yeah it still can be congenital. It can be congenital long QT syndrome that patient did not know. So now what do we do? So I wanted to uh, uh, tell everybody that, you know, that how we do this, you know, VT in structurally normal heart and VT uh, uh, in the structurally abnormal heart. And so but, in, uh, the, in this case, the problem, yeah. So before that, actually, what is the, now, what is the explanation for the HTT changes that the ST elevation in EVR and the depression in all the leads now? Post, post okay. Be, uh, post PT changes. So one thing, uh, what did I have a comment on that? The post resuscitation, sometimes we do see changes, uh, particularly when they use AP. Uh, and some some uh, ambulance crews, they use over enthusiastic AP. And we sometimes see the ST segment diffuse elevation. Here it is only AVR. And and it can be because of that, but unlikely. And then we had these coexistent issues with metabolic derangements. Patient's potassium was like 3.1, but more importantly, patient was acidotic. pH was 7.1 or something like seven, something that was corrected. And then hypotension, that was also got better. Uh, we gave the uh, initial uh, blood transfusion also following the C-section. And this EKG is after okay. correcting all that. Um, uh, coronary spasm possible, but we were very careful as Khalid Mohsin mentioned that can it be aortic, the, the coronary dissection in the pregnancy that is also an important issue. Now, luckily this was AVR ST elevation and then ST depression. The coronary dissection in the left main in the pregnancy, it is uniformly actually can be fatal, but the most common is inferior. And I looked at the aortic root and I was, you know, the only way it can do the dissection, the aortic root shows some dilatation and some AI, which was not present. I lost another patient like pregnancy related uh, death and uh, we did not cath and uh, patient died. We didn't have any time. And uh, in the postmortem, it was shown that she had single coronary artery single coronary. So, and I was feeling badly about this patient also that if we cannot make her, once the baby is out, then it was all, all good. I was happy. Once the baby is out, it is all in my court. If I do cath, if I do anything, I'm okay, you know, no, no worries. But the EF was good. Um, subsequently correction of the metabolic derangements, all this EKG much better looking and, and, and then the question is in the in a you know VT in a structure in normal art, what is the long QT more or most likely? But the other possibilities are the CPVT, you know, uh, is also possible because of the initial polymorphic uh, VT. So we don't know, and there is no family history of sudden cardiac death, but it is important to keep in your mind in the young patient to divide these categories into two: the structurally normal and structurally abnormal. And it's structurally normal goes into those on the right hand panel that you are seeing. And I think Khaled Mosin went through this nicely a couple of few weeks ago. So uh, the RV is borderline dilated. And this is another issue. Uh, when we, you have this Brugada or RVOT tachycardia, everybody sees RV dilated. Even the uh, uh, cardiac MR people call it like not sure. So I usually blind them. I don't tell them anything. 
and then tell them to read this cardiac MR independent. Uh, so what is the next move? Rafik sir, what will be your suggestion in such a case? Well, I mean, uh, we have to study the, R, first of all, RV, uh, cardiac MRI, and then the decision have to be made whether the patient is an ICD or not. I mean, there is no question because there is nothing else to do. Uh, and the stakes are very, even though you are defining it as polymorphic VT, it is basically ventricular fibrillation. Because, yeah. yeah, anything that lasts more than, and the patient passes out, paramedics and shock them. So it was a VF. So. so we are planning to do all that as an outpatient traffic by, in the meantime, we gave the, uh, the sub-Q uh, ICD. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Sir, do you want to share? No, I think it's getting late today. 12.30, 10.30 p.m. your time. Uh, it doesn't Sorry, matter. Probably I took longer time. It is 11.25. 11.25 there, right? No, I think it's late, right? So let's do it next time. Uh, Such an interesting case, I could not resist myself to sh not to share, you know? No, no, no that's <laughs> good. Excellent, okay. excellent case. Okay, excellent time. case. Sir, okay. yeah. something. In these cases, sometimes we get such a problem. Uh, given that there, there is QT prolongation, and we do not have a reliable cardiac MRI uh, facility where they can interpret the cardiac MRI quite well. What should we do? Should we go for ICD? Well, let's, let's make an assumption that you had a cardiac MRI and it's normal. So patient will still get an ICD. So no, yeah. Yes, so, yeah. so even if the cardiac MRI is positive, it gives us a diagnosis, uh, arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, but a normal MRI in case of long QT syndrome, patient will get ICD anyway. Yeah. Yeah, that's why we give the ICD and then study as an outpatient. And this RV borderline dilatation, you know, it will probably disappear, my thing. I think it's a long QT. And then yeah. we are yeah. thinking about uh, any role for genetic st uh, studies and the uh, family yeah. members. Definitely. Definitely, yeah. they, all the families should be screened for this. Yeah. I think so. We are seeing something in this country as well. The physicians and the patients are getting well informed about the role of ICD, particularly when the ejection fraction is low. Uh, many of our patients who are uh, well off and the family is uh, uh, well educated, they go through the Google, uh, think about what are the options available, and. Some of them are coming to us and asking, should we be implanting an uh, uh, ICD? Uh, that's very encouraging actually in this country because we did have that before. And another thing is seeing that, we are seeing that, that this time for the last six months, we are having this ECD program and also IPDI, the other programs. This has increased the level of expertise of the cardiologists and physicians as a whole. And I think as a whole, there is a tendency to uh, implant a pacemaker unnecessarily that has been reduced to some extent. Atharva, what do you say? True. I am absolutely agree with you. That's my observation. So over the last six months, the tendency of suggestion that you have to have a uh, pacemaker whenever you have a, a lower heart rate, even during sleep, uh, that has been going down a little bit. One of the thing about long QT, you have to be careful who you implant the ICD. Because in some variant, which are the adrenergic dependent, if you use the ICD, um, they can actually get multiple shocks. I mean, I have seen one young kid in Bangladesh, the ICD basically battery ran out in two days. Because every time she gets a shock, she gets a, um, a more adrenergic drive. and it, caused more PT. So we have to be carefully choose this case. And, and I have a simple rule for the fellows. If it is your problem, think about it. If it is patient's problem, then go aggressive. If it is, but sometimes we discover things by EKG and this, and patient is completely asymptomatic. In those cases, I will request that you talk to the expert before you do anything. But if the patient has a dramatic presentation, patient has clinical issues, then you need to probably put more efforts to, to, to circumvent the problem. Uh, but it is always important to share 
education and accountability. Uh, we are still accountable in what we do because uh, and in the in the in the U.S. Uh, Ravik Bhai will j jump in for the ICD. We we maintain the registry, the indication, and the and the payor. They'll go over that. For the PCI, we participate in the PCI registry. You know, and then our data is public. Atar Bhai. So. Uh... We are going to conclude the session, sir. Actually, yes. we are sorry that we cannot uh, have the yes, sir. Next time, next week, sir. Actually, uh, big congratulation to Choudhury Hafiz for presenting such beautiful academic cases. It has opened some good lessons to us. Choudhury Hafiz, thank you very much. And finally, sir, actually, Dr. Kanis Fatima and Urun Maski also they deserve the congratulation. We are happy to share their ECGs. And Dr. Khaled Mohsin. Abdullah Jamil, then Dr. Asad Zaman, congratulations to you all for participation for this discussion. Sir, next day, next Saturday, we'll have presenter Dr. Uh, Professor Abdul Kader Akondo and Aisha Kader. And in that day, actually, the third, actually, we'll wait for the Rupik Sir's presentation. Actually, our, our all participants actually wait for Rupik Sir's participation. It is two days, it is, uh, time is short, so next week day. And so they have to I thank you very much. I congratulate myself because I was able to fix my audio system in the computer. It right. was good. <laughs> good yeah. And okay. I called, uh, I called uh, Zoom, I called uh, Razor, the company. And then finally, I was able to, this was a simple thing. Two speakers were in dyssynchrony. It was like Rafik Bhai's <laughs> issue. Synchronized <laughs> speakers and then it solved the problem. <laughs> Hafiz Bhai, may, may I ask you a question uh, yeah. about this time? Turkish lady who had an uh, stitch and did, did she lose a lot of fortune in the casino in of uh, Las Vegas before she? I was... will find that out when I show you the <laughs> film because I'm not sure whether we did the right thing yet. So we are watching, you know. The surgeons came in and asking, does he have a role to fix it? I said, what are you going to fix? I could not show you the LAD. You want to go and find the LAD? Be my guest. And then he ran away. <laughs> 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 so sir uh, we can conclude the session sir thank you everybody thank you sir assalamu thank you Rivu. thank you sir and finally khali kujjavan thank you very much for being with us mosi never too much silent nice in the chamber hello so, Kanis Fatima, thank you very much for your excellent presentation. Sir, I'm Mr. Fatima. I'm Mr. Fatima. Sir, I'm Mr. Fatima. Sir, I'm Mr. Fatima. Sir, you can open your mask. Okay. Unmask your 